I'm going to talk to you for the next uh, 15 minutes or so about uh, my current uh, uh, project in progress, uh, work entitled The Xenotext. Uh, my talk is uh, sufficiently pretentious enough to have a, an epigraph. <laughs> Uh, this uh, from F.T. Marinetti, uh, who writes in the Technical Manifesto of Futurist Literature that there is also a microbe essential to the vitality of art. And I guess I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this microbe. The Xenotext is a kind of experiment, uh, a literary exercise that explores the aesthetic potential of genetics in the modern milieu, doing so in order to make literal the renowned aphorism of William S. Burroughs, who has declared that the word is now a virus. My experiment proposes to address some of the sociological implications of biotechnology by manufacturing a xenotext, a beautiful anomalous poem whose alien words might subsist like a harmless parasite inside the cell of another life form. Now, futurists have already begun to speculate that even now we might store data by encoding textual information into genetic nucleotides, thereby creating messages made from DNA, messages that we can then implant like genes inside cells where such data might persist undamaged and unaltered through myriad cycles of mitosis, all the while preserved for recovery and decoding. Genetics has thus endowed biology with a possible literary use, granting every geneticist the power to become a poet in the medium of life. Now, I've composed my own example of living poetry so that when translated into a gene and then integrated into the cell, the text nevertheless gets expressed by the organism which in response to this grafted genetic sequence begins to manufacture a viable benign protein, one that according to the original chemical alphabet is itself yet another text. I am in effect engineering a primitive bacterium so that it becomes not only a durable archive for storing a poem, but also a usable machine for writing a poem in response. This is the protagonist of the project, Dinococcus radiodurans. This is the proposed symbiote for my xenotext, in part because this extremophile can repair its own DNA so quickly that the germ resists mutation. It's kind of an evolutionary dead end. It can survive extremes of heat and cold, even desiccation. You can scorch it, freeze it, wither it, and still it endures. Uh, it can survive exposure to the vacuum of outer space. It can even withstand dosages of gamma rays 1,000 times more lethal than the dosage needed to obliterate a human being. A uh, germ with this kind of radio resistance might conceivably survive nuclear warfare, and some biologists have even suggested that an ancestor of this organism must have had at least some exposure to an extraterrestrial environment in order to have acquired these environmental immunities. Now, I apologize for this uh, crash course in genetics, um, <laughs> and I certainly apologize to the scientists in the audience for my dilettantishness. Um, Writing the xenotext requires uh, that I create a chemical alphabet of codons, of genetic triplets, made by permuting the four nucleotides in DNA. Uh, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine are the nucleobases that contain the information-bearing content of DNA. Uh, each of these codons, these three-letter words, uh, is interpreted as an instruction for creating one of 20 amino acids used to make a protein. Now, I can assign each amino acid to a given letter of the alphabet, and by stringing these codons together, I can create chemical messages enciphered as sequences of DNA. Now, because there exists a codependent biochemical relationship between any preliminary DNA sequence and its resulting messenger RNA sequence, which creates the string of amino acids in the protein, my two poems must likewise be bijectively codependent in order for this project to work. So just as adenine and thymine are mutually encipher each other on the strand of DNA, uh, so also do cytosine and guanine uh, mutually encipher each other with uh, the uh, uh, molecule uracil standing in for thymine during the process of transcription. Uh, my two poems have to actually mimic uh, this relationship uh, biochemically. Now this uh, slide depicts a sample strand of DNA uh, coiled into a helix, and uh, this is a standard kind of picture of the molecule. Uh, the rungs of the ladder consist of codependent nucleotides, and you'll notice that on one side uh, of the ladder, uh, A is always paired with T, and C is always paired with G. And uh, typically the information is read from what is called the five prime end of the three prime end of that DNA sequence. Uh, so I will ask you to look at the uh, left-hand side of the sequence in this uh, unraveled DNA molecule. 
when uh, messenger RNA uh, transcription occurs, the sample strand of DNA here untwists and the bonds between the codependent nucleotides are broken, exposing uh, each of the bases. And the strand on the far left is the encoding sequence in this case, and the strand on the far right is the template sequence. The strand in the middle is the transcription sequence of messenger RNA, which uses the template strand to create a copy of the encoding strand. Except that in this case, wherever you might expect to see a T in the DNA, you'll get a U in the messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA fragment eventually breaks away from this strand of DNA and then travels to a structure in the cell called a ribosome where the protein is manufactured. Uh, the ribosome is kind of like the factory in the cell, and it reads each of the codons, each of the three-letter triplets in the DNA, interpreting each of these uh, three-letter words as an instruction for building a specific amino acid, each of which gets strung together into a molecular sequence like a series of charms on a chain of jewelry, thereby creating a strand of protein, a strand that then undergoes a process of folding and bending due to the electrochemical forces within uh, the molecule, torquing the protein into a conformation that requires the lowest amount of energy to sustain. And the surface contour of this folded strand determines the kind of biochemical interaction that the protein can perform with other enzymes in the cell. Uh, in effect, uh, the important thing to take away from this is that there is this kind of codependent relationship between uh, the DNA sequence and the resulting uh, amino acid sequence. I'll give you an example here of a, a sample cipher. This is not what I actually used uh, in the course of the creation of my poem, but I hope it's illustrative. I'm going to try and explain how I have to write these two poems. Let us imagine pairing off all the letters of the alphabet so that they are mutually assigned to each other, knowing that there exist seven billion, nine hundred and five, excuse me, seven trillion, nine hundred and five billion, eight hundred and fifty three million, five hundred and eighty thousand, six hundred and twenty five different ways of enciphering the alphabet according to this one constraint alone. Now, uh, there's effectively about eight trillion ways of doing this. Choose a cipher from this set, one you think that might uh, actually produce interesting results, then write an eloquent poem such that if we replace every single letter with its counterpart from our chosen cipher, we get yet another eloquent poem. Now, no poet in the history of poetics has ever actually imagined creating two texts that mutually encipher each other in this way. And I plan to integrate my encoded text into the genetic code of the cell so that during transcription, the messenger RNA in the cell might translate my string of codons into the required commands for manufacturing a correspondent series of amino acids. Except that through this act of biochemical translation, this series of amino acids must also encipher a totally variant poem. I am trying, in effect, to design a biological cryptogram that consists of a meaningful text that can in turn be deciphered into yet another meaningful text. So for example, in this picture, the letter E might be enciphered by a preliminary template codon CCG, which uh, gets transcribed by the cell into its correlative RNA codon GGC. And this codon represents the instruction for creating the amino acid glycine, which might in turn be assigned to the letter L. The letters E and L are thus mutually correlated to each other by this codependent biochemical relationship between the DNA sequence and the RNA sequence. And hence, the letter L must be represented by the preliminary template codon GGC, which gets transcribed by the cell into its correlative RNA codon CCG, the given codon here for E. And this codon represents the instruction for creating the amino acid proline. It just so happens that glycine and proline have these mutually correlated codons. Uh, all the letters of the alphabet must follow this constraint of codependent encipherment for the project to work. I hope that this uh, chart is illustrative. You can see the way in which if I wrote the word cell, the organism in this case would respond by writing the word glee, and here the letters L and E are mutually correlated with each other. Now, to compose such a poem, I've had to teach myself a whole bunch of new tricks. Uh, I've had to design a piece of homespun software that permits me to input a cipher into a computer, which might then search through the entirety of the English lexicon, outputting all the words that mutually encipher each other according to my requisite constraint. And I've experimented with all kinds of heuristics, correlating letters that have, for example, equivalent recurrence in texts or equivalent positioning in words. And I've even explored codes that force the inclusion of a particular vocabulary. And here we've got the piece of software, at least the component part, that uh, does all this hard work for me. Uh, obviously, I would not be assigning, say, the letter A to the letter Z uh, and Z to A because I would eliminate probably many of the words in the language that actually contain the, the letter A. So I, I might, for 
example, try to equate E and T with each other and I and N with each other because these pairs of letters have almost congruent frequency in the language. Uh, here I've given you a list of the most commonly occurring letters in the order in which they appear. I might equate A and H with each other because they often appear as the second letter in a word. They're the most commonly occurring second letters in words. And I might equate S and D with each other because they often appear at the end of a word. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying my best to come up with a, a set of heuristics for producing a relatively large vocabulary. And I have learned from experience, however, that even after improving the odds of generating a usable lexicon, any attempt to write, say, the rival of Hamlet has so far proven very difficult. Here is uh, one of the results uh, for this particular uh, cipher. Um, we're, off to <laughs> we're off to a bad start here, right? <laughs> With uh, a cipher that you would think would uh, be functional. Obviously, the word the turns out, turns out to be very difficult to actually encipher into this uh, process. Uh, because of, by simply assigning the two most commonly occurring letters to each other, I restrict myself then to having to use the word the and eat as the corresponding words. Wherever I use the word the, the organism has to use the word eat and vice versa. Now, I have run hundreds of experiments with my software and I've, I've yet to find a vocabulary more than 786 entries. And most of the results include only uh, a disconsolate array of monosyllabic words, most shorter than five letters. And I found that shorter deictic words, really useful words like the and 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 of and in, uh, all required for coherent syntactic discourse do not encode very easily into any of these lexicons. And often a very common usable word might translate into a very exotic but useless word. And any word of more than six letters is very rare. Uh, despite the fact that there are eight trillion possible ciphers, this one constraint of producing these mutually encoded words has turned out to be very difficult to fulfill. And after nearly four years of failure in trying to write two intelligible texts according to this very burdensome constraint, I have finally made the prerequisite breakthrough for my project. And here are the, uh, the two poems with the accompanying cipher. Uh, the poem on the left is the one that I would implant into the genome of the organism. And I'll read it to you. It, it begins, any style of life is prim. Oh, stay, my lyre, with wily ploys, moan the riff, the riff of any tune aloud, moan now my fate, in fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now, the organism would actually read that gene sequence and produce a protein in response, expressing uh, that particular gene. And uh, that particular protein would, in fact, encipher this following answer. The fairy is rosy of glow, in fate we rely. Moan more grief with any loss, any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay, oh stay my lyre, we wean him of any milk, any milk is rosy. Now you might want to uh, look carefully, you'll note that wherever you see the letter A, for example, in the poem on the left, you'll see the letter T in the poem on the right, and vice versa. Wherever a T appears in my poem, an A appears in the poem written by the organism. You'll note uh, that every single letter has that mutual correlation with each other uh, throughout the entire work. This is why the poem was so difficult to compose. Now, the text on the left is, I think, written by me as a kind of masculine assertion about the aesthetic creation of life. <laughs> While the text on the right is written by the microbe, I think, as a kind of feminine refutation about the woebegone absence of life. And to me, the two poems kind of resemble abbreviated Petrarchan sonnets. They are 14-line poems. Uh, in dialogue with each other, I wanted to find two poems that were in dialogue with each other. And they're much like poems written in the elegiac pastoral tradition of the herd boy answered by the nymphette. Uh, moreover, the protein that enciphers the poem by the microbe uh, is going to be chemically tagged so as to make the cell glow red in the dark. So it's immediately evident that the poet uh, is being written by the organism. So the microbe is, in effect, uh, going to fluoresce rubescently in a fey way that embodies the rosiness attributed to the fairy <laughs> described within the content of the poem itself. This chart is merely uh, designed to intimidate you with my vast <laughs> intelligence. 
Um, I, I had to explore numerous options for enciphering the poem as a sequence of amino acids since the sequence uh, needed to fold up viably into a working protein. This is the next constraint. Is that once I have these two poems, I now have to figure out how to encipher them as a protein in a way that will cause the protein to fold up uh, and remain viable within the cell. Now, I did statistical analyses of various ciphers, determining their likelihood of surviving within the organism, and I narrowed my candidates down to about a dozen ranked options. And then I uh, submitted these candidate proteins to a supercomputer, which took about six weeks to simulate two femtoseconds of folding for each of the proteins. I also submitted a 13th wildcard candidate, just out of curiosity. And uh, while my predict predicted contenders ranked very highly, I uh, actually had them all ranked. And it, as it turned out, uh, I was correct in assuming that uh, uh, the, the best ones would, in fact, be ranked highly. Uh, I was so somewhat dis surprised to discover that the wild card, protein 13, turned out to be the best one. So this chart depicts the cipher used to encode my poem into that specific sequence of amino acids. Uh, this image depicts the sequence of DNA codons used to generate protein 13 within the cell. Uh, each codon is assigned to a letter of the alphabet, so that, for example, ACG is the letter A, and GTG is the letter N, and ATA is the letter Y, and AAG is a space. So the first four codons at the top left uh, represent the word any plus a space. And the full sequence enciphers my poem about the aesthetic creation of life, the, the poem that I would insert into the genetic uh, material of the organism. Now, this image depicts the sequence of amino acids encoding the poem written by the microbe in response to my text. And each amino acid is conventionally represented by a letter of the alphabet, so that, for example, T is threonine, V is valine, I is isoleucine, S is serine, etc. And in this case, the first four letters of the sequence encipher the word the plus a space. And in this case, the sequence encodes the poem written by the microbe in response to my implanted text. This is the image of the backbone of the resulting protein after two femtoseconds of folding. Uh, it effectively depicts what the poem is expected to look like at the atomic level in the cell. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of native structure. I actually, uh, during this first uh, trial, tried to make the protein as soluble as possible. And uh, consequently, uh, it uh, doesn't have a great deal of secondary structure. There's a few little helices in it. Uh, this image depicts the atomic structure of the protein. Uh, it is, in effect, a, the molecular embodiment of the xenotext, a kind of sculptural translation of the poem itself. And I have, in fact, built a model of this protein out of toy molecules uh, for exhibit in an art gallery. And uh, here is the actual uh, exhibit of uh, protein, in thir protein 13 installed uh, at the Berry Art Gallery in Manchester for display during the text festival um, last April. Uh, on March 31st, uh, last year, uh, 2011, I received confirmation from the laboratory at the University of Calgary that my poetic cipher, gene XP13, had in fact caused E. coli to fluoresce red in our test runs on that particular organism. I wanted to try it out and make sure that it would work, meaning that when implanted in the genome of this bacterium, my poem beginning, Any Style of Life is Prim, did in fact cause the bacterium to write in response its own poem beginning, The Fairy is Rosy of Glow. Hence, I was the first poet in the history of literature to engineer a bacterium so that it could write a poem. The uh, lab went on to isolate the resulting protein in order to confirm that uh, my molecule protein 13 was indeed folding according to our projections and simulations. And so far as we could tell, the poem was functioning without adverse effects upon the cell. And the lab then went on to spend the next two months uh, analyzing the results in, in an attempt to characterize the protein, uh, whereupon I would be in the meantime, trying to figure out how to get it into the actual target organism, the extremophile Dinococcus radiodurans. And here you actually see uh, the uh, bacterium fluorescing under the microscope. Well, uh, after reaching this particular milestone, uh, I received a lot of worldwide attention from the media. Uh, I was uh, featured prominently in The Guardian. Uh, I was interviewed on BBC World. Uh, about 40 million people in the world, I guess, that now knew about uh, the Xenotext. Uh, I was even interviewed by New Scientist magazine, uh, re-interviewed re by Nature magazine. So I, I enjoyed a lot of attention for about six weeks of fanfare uh, before I got word from the lab that despite all indications, uh, the results of later tests suggested that protein 13 was only half as massive as expected. Uh, this is bad news. Uh, and given that the poem was equal in size to the fluorescent tag which E. coli expressed, all these results suggested that the organism was either censoring my poem before expression or destroying it after expression. I had not engineered the first uh, microbial writer. Uh, instead, I had engineered the first microbial critic. 
I, I had thus created a, con a conundrum for the scientists who could not account for this problem uh, since I had done everything correctly and the gene uh, should have worked, given that my custom design of the tag functioned properly. I mean, the scientists were very impressed that you know, I'm, I'm a doctorate in English. I'm an English major. And uh, nevertheless got uh, this uh, protein synthesis uh, to work properly, even though graduate students uh, don't get their projects to work the first time. So they were quite pleased with me. Uh, now they're interested because it didn't work. Uh, but I would have to figure out on my own what went wrong, and I'd have to, in effect, re redesign uh, the protein in order to figure out how to make it more stable within the organism. And I have to say, I was working on this project during my sabbatical, so at this point now I felt like my sabbatical was entirely squandered. <laughs> Well, uh, despite this setback, I've spent the last eight months or so uh, attempting to re-encipher the poem so that it might have a better chance of surviving in the organism. And even though my first draft of Protein 13 was the most appealing candidate based on the methods used to create it, I've gone back to the drawing board uh, and entirely redesigning the sequence from the ground up, one amino acid at a time. And I've managed to figure out how to improve its folding profile uh, significantly. I think I've nearly tripled its stability, thereby producing candidates that look much more beautiful. And in this case here, this has got a lot of secondary structure to it. It looks like something you might find in a textbook. Uh, it's, a, it's a much prettier version of the poem. Uh, now I just have to rebuild the gen genetic sequence and uh, do some more test runs. I should note that uh, uh, it's currently uh, going through a second uh, revision. Uh, I submitted uh, the gene sequence for manufacture, and we actually uh, uh, inserted it into uh, uh, the bacterium. And yet again, it fluoresced beautifully, and we thought, great. We've succeeded. And then uh, once we've characterized, the protein discovered that it was half as massive as it should be. And that, of course, the uh, organism was continuing to destroy uh, the poem. Uh, so I actually am currently working on a third candidate, uh, uh, yet one more. And it's even more beautiful than this one. <laughs> even more tightly configured. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm right now trying, to, I guess, to contend with the uh, threat of failure on this project. Uh, uh, the manuscript is going very well, of course, but the, the uh, bacterium is proving to be quite recalcitrant and capricious. Thank you for your indulgence. I appreciate it.